Hello, welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 222 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 78 of A Storm of Swords, that's Samwell 5. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes for interesting information about the characters and geography of this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing well. I had a nice lunch on our work campus with our lunch friends today. You did not. Uh, you were not in attendance. But you were missed. I, I was I was actually available, but I was very busy, so I just I didn't even bother responding. Uh, I didn't want right. didn't want to disappoint you all. <laughs> well, we had a good time. We did have a good time. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm well. We I've been mostly playing board games. We're we're, we're in early January of 2024, and um, I'm still playing all learning all the board games that Lucas bought me for Christmas. Well, not bought just me. He bought some for himself. But the current count, I think, is 14. Wow. That is he a went lot of games. Crazy. He's absolutely gone berserk. But they've all been hits so far. We've had a great time playing them. So we're Good. about... I think we've played seven of the 14. Does he use that same website you do to vet board games? Board Game Geek or whatever it's called? Yes, exactly. Um, but he has, he has a much broader... Uh, spectrum than I do of which games to buy. Okay. I would never have bought any of these, but uh, we've enjoyed every one of them. So. All right, so there you go. Getting outside your comfort zone. Exactly, exactly. Uh, tell tell me, wh- when, when is your wife's birthday? It is uh, at the end of this past year. It's in December, near the holidays. Oh, is it? Yes. Is yes. it before Christmas or after Christmas? Before. Is it? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was early January. Nope, it is uh, in December. And uh, I, I had a, a story I meant to tell you about it, and I, I completely forgot. And, you know, you and I were just discussing before we started recording that once upon a time, I, uh, I had a, a master plan for my wife's birthday, and it, it started out with a very high bar. I was going to take her to the restaurant inside the only five-star hotel in our entire metropolitan area. Uh, it then dropped one little notch to Ruth's Chris, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, which is a very nice and uh, nice restaurant, which would have set me back a good bit. But you can find them most places. Yes, yes. Dropped a little more uh, when we tried then to go to Bonefish Grill and continued on downward until we ended up and an Italian restaurant that I had to buy one, get one free coupon for. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's that's the edited highlights of that story, because th- that was also the same year, I believe, that you were, she wanted a very expensive present, and you managed to play her by offering her alternative stick, and eventually she gave up trying to choose, and you didn't buy anything. That's what I do best, is provide alternatives to already decided on plans. <laughs> That's my little finger Baelish moments right there. <laughs> when, when I'm secretly manipulating things to my mm-hmm. favor. Yes, many of you at lunch refer to that day as the crowning achievement of my life. It I... was. It was special. I'll give you that. But So tell us about this birthday then. What happened here? Well, so this, this birthday, I, I had a plan again. And this time she was much more involved in its downfall than last time, <laughs> where she was just a passenger <laughs> as the as the night plummeted. You know, there's a a very high end uh, steakhouse here. It's up on my side of town that I goes know. I know the very one you mean. Yes. All out for Christmas for you know holiday lights and such things. It's uh, quite a big deal. It's very hard to get in. You basically have to get your reservations like a year in advance if you want to get there. If you want to be seated between Thanksgiving and the New Year, right. so right. so I wasn't going to take her there for dinner because I didn't have reservations and it was the week of. So, but there is a nice Thai restaurant not too far from here. So my plan was we were going to go to the Thai restaurant, have a nice dinner. Pad Sayu is both of our favorite Thai dishes or er, dish, and then we were going to go get drinks at this high end. 
um, oh. steakhouse because they have a lot of really nice like bar type areas where you can see all the lights. And... I, I've never been inside, so so this is all news to me. But I believe oh, you. I believe you. Yes. So that was what I proposed to her, and she was like, "Well, why don't we just go to the steakhouse, forget the Thai restaurant, and just throw our names on the list, and we'll just enjoy the ambiance of the place and look at the lights, and you know, we'll." Uh, have, she'll have some drinks and we'll wait for our names to be called. And I was like, okay, <laughs> if you want, <laughs> it's your birthday. So we did that and we brought Molly with us. So, you know, it uh, dropped the the romance aspect of it a little bit, but you know. Actually, I think it, that stayed pretty steady. <laughs> the presence of your daughter neither <laughs> increased nor decreased the romance of the situation. That is true. That is actually probably true. So we put our name in the list, and she said, the the lady behind the, that was taking names for the list, said we were 67th on the list. Good Lord above. For that night. <laughs> we got there early, too. We got there at like 5.30 to try and increase our chances. Good grief. So I, I turned to Stacey. I was like, you sure you want to go through with this? And she's like, yeah, it's beautiful. We'll stay a while. Let's just see how it goes. So we spend an hour. They give you free cheese and crackers. And they give you free, I think it's eggnog or something like that. They give you free stuff to, to, to help buy the, bide your time. And we're walking around, looking at all the lights and just chatting and taking pictures and eating our cheese and crackers. And, uh, oh, gingerbread men. They give you gingerbread men, too. And an hour goes by, and we move from 67th to 20th on the list in one hour. Well, that's a we pretty like, good hour, yeah. Okay, we can do this. By that math, it shouldn't be too much longer. So we wait around another hour, and we move from 20th to 15th. So that, <laughs> there was a bad <laughs> second hour. Yeah, exactly. So we were like, okay, we're not going to wait around a third hour. You know, at this yeah. pace, it'll be five hours before we get in there. Right. So, uh, so we leave, and ultimately on her birthday dinner, we ended up at a uh, – takeout Chinese restaurant <laughs> that, well that is, is mostly frequented by high school kids over their lunch break. So <laughs> nice. Nice. I thought to myself, well, I've done it again. I spent 40 you have, bucks on the whole dinner. But you're right. That's on Stacy. She clearly chose this path. She did. Was she, was she getting lambasted at the bar? Was she like just drinking <laughs> cocktail after cocktail? She was not. She, oh, I, I, strange. I, uh, yeah. So, you know. It wasn't uh, it wasn't quite as mastermind mind, uh, type move as I had last time, but uh, no, you know, no. Um, my other story, which is nowhere near as good as that, I have to say it. But um, I was driving home from my New Year celebration, and I was in a little rural town in North Carolina, and I we stopped at a Panera because we were with people who. You know, when you're traveling with other people, you sort of like, you tend to go for the lowest common denominator on, on lunch. So we stopped at a Panera and it was, cool. okay. I like yeah. Panera, it's yeah. fine. Sure. But when we went in there, they were playing Christmas songs, you know, seasonally, it made sense. And the first song up was by The Wedding Present, my favorite band from England, who no one in the United States even knows or has heard of. I, I do not know or have heard of them. So. Oh, Philistine. I've sung them on the podcast. Oh, so I have heard of them. I've just forgotten yeah. that I've heard of them. Oh. You possibly wouldn't recognize them from my renditions. <laughs> Could be that too. <laughs> so it was very strange. I was like, I, I was sort of looking around like, is this real? Am this I actually joke? hearing the wedding present in here? <laughs> they, their Christmas song is very good. The Christmas song is, is, is the kind of Christmas song that if it was Taylor Swift, it would be a huge hit. But oh, it's the right. wedding present. So it gets played once in a blue moon, you know. Well, I'll have to listen to it. What's the, do you remember what the song's called? I can find no. it. No. Wedding present Christmas song should Yeah, be exactly. Track. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's get down to business. How did we leave Samuel Tarley? Last we saw of Sam, he was manning the Night's Watch Swingometer, the voting for the new... Do you understand the word swingometer? No, but yeah, it's funny, so funny name. On election night in the UK, the before sort of computer graphics, they used to have a big sort of like a a big sort of semicircle with a sweeping arm and they would move the arm showing where they thought the uh, breakdown of seats was going to land. And it was known as the swingometer. Okay. So 
The voting for the new Lord Commander uh, was getting pretty tedious, marred by intransigence, but leavened with some humour as Dolores Ed's anti-campaign. Um, he was also Sam was also trying to figure out a happy future for Gilly and her baby. Miguel, why don't we give the summary of this one? All right. Well, Sam accompanies Maester Eamon, as well as the current contenders for promotion to Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, including Three Finger Hob and Dolorous Ed, to an audience with King Stannis and Melisandre. Bowen Marsh, as Castellan of Castle Black, and Lord Stuart is also in attendance. Sam feels very out of place and is made even more uncomfortable by the looks he keeps receiving from Melisandre. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. It's clear from the start that the king is angry. His mood is not improved by the groveling from Janice Slint regarding Stannis' dispatching the wildling force at the gate. Stannis cuts right to the chase. The Lord Commander elections have lasted too long. He wants a man selected tonight. Slint suggests the Watch would benefit from royal guidance. That suggestion outrages his brothers. It's nobody's decision but the Night's Watch brothers who has elected Lord Commander. Stannis agrees and tells Slint that if he wants Stannis to recommend him for more Lord Commander, he should have the guts to say so. Marsh argues that who would be better to lead the Black Cloaks than one who once led the Gold Cloaks of King's Landing. Stannis suggests that any other candidate would be better, including the cook. Stannis tells Slint that he believed John Arryn's evidence regarding Slint's bribery and payoffs, but Robert merely shrugged it away. Stannis recalls two men sent to testify against Slint that conveniently died on their rounds. Stannis doesn't really care who is chosen, even if it's Slint. He just wants it done now. There is a war to fight. Sir Dennis Malister incorrectly assumes Stannis is referring to the war for the Iron Throne. The Night's Watch can't help there. That's not the fight Stannis means, and swears to never ask the Night's Watch to help in that fight. He only asks that they defend the wall, as they always have. The King does require other things from the Night's Watch, however. He wants their castles and the gift. This statement ignites an explosion of heated and exasperated responses from the Black Brothers. When they're talked out, the King reminds them he could take it by force, but he'd rather not. When asked what he will do with the gift, Stannis says only... Make better use of it than you have. It's a low bar. Pretty low bar, yes. As for the castles, the Night's Watch will keep Castle Black, the Shadow Tower, and East Watch. The rest Stannis will rebuild and garrison himself within the year. He plans to make the Night Fort his seat. Melisandre speaks up and tells the men swords alone can't stop the darkness that's coming. Only the Lord of Light can do that. She adds that this war is for life itself. And if they fail, the world dies. These remarks are met with confused and doubtful glances by the men. It's Eamon who speaks up. He correctly realises it's the war for the dawn she speaks of, but questions where the prince who was promised is. Melisange says he stands before them. Stannis is as or a high come again, and he bears Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. Stannis seems annoyed by the Azora high talk and sends the men away, except for Sam and Eamon. Stannis asks, and Sam confirms, that he's the one who killed the other with the dragonglass sword. Melisandre adds that it makes sense as dragonglass is frozen fire. Stannis says there's a great deal of obsidian, otherwise known as dragonglass, on dragonstone, and he's commanded his castellan to mine as much as he can while he still holds dragonstone. The hope is to mine enough to arm themselves against the others before dragonstone is lost to them. Sam points out that the dragonglass was ineffective against whites, to which Melisarn responds that it makes sense. Whites are just animated corpses. Swords and fire will do for them. Speaking of fire, Eamon asks to see Lightbringer. Stannis brandishes the sword and Sam describes it to Eamon. It glows and shimmers with colours of orange, gold and red as if on fire. Stannis then dismisses them, 
As they descend the stairs, Eamon asked Sam if he felt heat from the sword. Sam had not. He asked if the scabbard was burned from holding a flaming sword. No. Eamon then drops the subject. Sam asks if the maester plans to do anything to guide the Lord Commander vote tonight. As a maester, it's not his place to meddle in such affairs. Sam, on the other hand, is free to do as he likes. Sam decides to act quickly before his bravery leaves him. He finds Cotter Pike and doesn't correct the man when he believes Sam is here at the maester's bidding. Pike quickly gets what Sam is after and refuses to concede the vote to Dennis Malister. Pike adds that he doesn't want the job, Castle Black is too far from the sea, but that Malister is too old and unlike Pike, he lacks the fighting prowess due to his age. Pike only trusts himself to stand up to Stannis. Next, Sam tries the same approach with Sir Dennis Malister. Malister is kind, patient and courteous, but it's the same result. He will not concede to Pike. The man is iron-born and was raping and murdering from a young age. Plus, he's illiterate and uncouth. Like Pike, he's never desired the honour of Lord Commander. He stepped aside in the previous two elections for men he felt were more worthy of the role. Sam says there's another option. And this option was trusted by Lord Commander Mormont, Corn Halfhan and Donald Noy. This option comes from old blood, was castle born and raised, a trained fighter and well learned. Not to mention, his father was Hand of the King and his brother a king. Who could they be talking about, really? Sir Dennis seems to pick up on who Sam means, who could it be, and considers him as a possibility. However, he still believes himself as the best choice. Sam lies and tells him that Stannis told Aemon in him he plans to choose Pike if no decision is made tonight. Sam rushes, well, for Sam anyway, back to Pike. He asks Pike if he'd withdraw for someone other than Sir Dennis Malister. When Pike asks who he has in mind, Sam says that this person is a fighter who held the wall when Donald Noy died. The only problem is he's a bastard, much like Pike. Pike likes the idea of choosing a bastard irking the stuck-up Sir Dennis, but no, Pike considers himself the only option. Sam again lies. The king told Eamon and Sam that he that he, the king, plans to choose Sir Dennis Malister. <sighs> that wily Sam. Well, I tell you. You, you know what I particularly like about the way that was constructed is the fact that he didn't go into the conversations with the plan formed. Because if he'd gone into the conversations with the plan formed, he would have said that thing to Pike first and then to yes. Malister. It's only when he had the two conversations, it sort of dawned on him what he could do. And then he went back to Pike, which made for a slightly longer chapter, but also more uh, a more realistic conversation, I think. Yes, and that was a question that I had. Did Sam know going in, or did he make it up on the fly when he realized neither man was going to step aside for the other? The, I say the latter. I I agree, because yeah. for the exact reason that you say. Yeah. He, he said to Cotter Pike, would you step aside for another the first time? And Cotter Pike was like, no, you know, not, not of the people who are currently... Uh, vying for this spot as well but he didn't mention who so it a, a, leaves a little bit of room for interpretation i guess yeah i suppose so because because i suppose it's possible that that was the opening gambit in the plan and if pike had said you know sure yeah absolutely if you find the right person and well yeah yeah i see what you're saying he may have had the plan from the get-go yeah i think maybe that's when the when the seed was planted for the idea for the plan, but not necessarily fleshed out. I think maybe at that point he was thinking, "Who? Who else? Who else can I find?" Right. right. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook or two, if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com/ghostsheronhall. You can find the link in our show notes. So, um, sort of going back to the top of the, the, the chapter, so Stannis is very much torn between imposing his will on the Night's Watch, which which is a very Stannis thing. He wants to impose his will on pretty much everything he touches. Uh, <laughs> and honouring the Night's Watch rules. And this whole shtick, of course, is rigid rule following. So there's only so far he can go at trying to sort of coerce them into doing what he wants. It's not, I, I, and to be fair to him, I think he, he does a reasonable job. He says, just choose tonight. You know, I, right. he, 
he told them what he wants. He wants to, to have a discussion with the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch about reinvigorating the forts along the wall and occupying the gift. He right. can't do it with a seven people vying for the Lord Commander because he needs to have someone who can make a decision. Exactly. And I think uh, the last Sam chapter, Maester Eamon mentioned that the longest vote had gone on for like 200 and some days or something like that. <laughs> Stannis feels that 10 is nine days too long. So, Is it a two-thirds, two-thirds yes, of the votes? I think so, yeah. It's a terrible way to do it. <laughs> it is. It's a terrible way to do it. It's, it'd be better to have elimination. Eliminate the people, you know. Right. So yeah, you're down yeah, to yeah. two and then do a re-vote and then just a simple majority. Yeah, you have to get a minimum percentage to stick around is go to the thinking? next round yeah. yeah right and then hob and ed would have been eliminated there's right two right off the bat that are eliminated right. so yeah um i do like the fact of course I mean, we, we all like to beat up on janice slint because he deserves everything he gets but it's he nice does. to hear stannis really putting him in his place we and it's funny because we knew Slint was pretty corrupt and widely believed to be corrupt. But it is news that John Arryn had enough evidence against him to convict him. Uh, yes. And then basically Robert was just too lazy to overcome the inertia to remove him. That would have just yeah. created a new job for Robert of appointing a new gold head of the gold cloaks. We couldn't be bothered, you know. Or uh, uh, or getting someone else to do it, you know, just... Uh... Well, that's actually what would have happened. But even <laughs> yeah. that was too much for Robert, you know. <laughs> And it, his yeah. attitude was sort of better the devil you know. And it does make a certain amount of sense. But it is pretty slothful of him to not say, we can't have the head of the gold cloaks be this corrupt, this brazenly corrupt. Right. He could have simply said, and delegated it to Stannis and said, you know, yeah. Stannis or, or John Aaron, you know, fine, you made this mess. Yeah. Find a new Deal with it. commander yeah. then. But yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more that it was glad to see, I, I was glad to see Stannis speak up about what he knows about Slint. We had talked about that uh, in the John chapter when Stannis arrived, that he, that Slint and Stannis probably had some interactions and knew each right. other fairly well. I wish he had said all this in front of a larger audience. Yeah. You know, instead of just the, what was it, like five, maybe se seven men that were in attendance there. But, yeah. you know. But Marsh I was in attendance. Uh Bowen Marsh, and... Last in that previous Sam chapter, he withdrew and said, I put my support behind Jenna Slint. So, you know, maybe he can retract that now. That's right, because in this chapter, he reiterates that. But then he hears all of this that Stannis says about Slint. Right. So, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. And, you know, doesn't it just doesn't it just perfectly sum up politics that not only was Slint uh, not removed from office and get in any kind of trouble for clear violations of policy. But ultimately, not that long after, he was promoted to the small council and made Lord of Harrenhal. If, if you want a, 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 a contemporary example of this, you should look at what's going on in the UK, the Horizon scandal. I, I recommend it to our readers, to our listeners, to uh, have a look at what the Horizon scandal is. It's, it's fascinating. Huh, it's, uh, okay sort of government corruption and just uh, how it affected the citizens or a small group of the citizens of the country very oh. negatively. Okay, good to know. And But, you know, I was thinking about Slint. If not for Slint, Stannis might right now be sitting on the Iron Throne. Do tell. If you if you retrace steps backward... He took the bribe and betrayed Ned Stark, who was trying to put Stannis on the throne. That is very true. Ned, as King Regent, should have been able to make the call on what the Gold Cloaks do. He's the King Regent. They should listen to him. But instead, Littlefinger paid him off. Uh, Ned thought Littlefinger was paying them off on his account, on his yes. side. But instead, he paid him off on Cersei's side and, using uh, ned's money <laughs> using ned's money right <laughs> so that That's insult to injury right there i don't think stannis knows all this but if he did uh, uh, Stana, I mean, uh slint might be thrown off the top of the wall <laughs> it's a terrific point because if yeah exactly i mean it absolutely it hinges on him and it actually would make stannis re-mad at his big brother 
Because if Robert had just listened to John Aaron and got rid of Slint... Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, that Robert wow. still causing problems for Stannis in his yeah. grave. So they, Stannis also mentions that Slint had men who were willing to testify against him murdered. Right. Um, well, that's an interesting thing. So Slint became aware of some sort of investigation against him. Enough to identify the people who were willing to testify against him. He must have known, therefore, that somebody in power was organising a sort of inquiry into his behaviour. And that person was John Arryn. And John uh-huh. Arryn later died. Right. Is Janice I see where Slint you're going. Possible? Yeah. I mean, he murdered the people willing to testify. Yeah, I see where you're going with this. We still, you know, it was, it was laid at the feet of Cersei. And um, she... Claims she insists she didn't do it, and we she, know that she, her, her alibi is she was having sex with her brother. <laughs> right, we know that Maester Pycelle uh, kept it going. You know, kept the illness going, but we don't know who initiated it. Right, we know. Yeah, we we know that he took Maester. I think it was Maester Coleman off of the case and took over care of John Aaron himself, but we don't know where it began. So, this could be as uh, John Air- uh, Janus Slink could be as much a candidate as anybody else. He's got yeah, motive. It seems to me you're not really solving the problem if you only murder the people willing to testify. The people that John Aaron have already talked to and have said, "Yeah, that Janus is lining his pockets." There's not much point killing them if you're going to leave John Aaron around. <laughs> right? Just go find <laughs> two more. <laughs> he knows now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You make a. Very good point there. But but Stannis is true to his court. The, the one thing that's interesting is, so he wants to rebuild the castle and occupy the gift uh, and then get the night fires burning, which I think, I assume that means fires along the wall to sort of indicate that the wall is occupied. Is that the idea? I, I think it is a, a, um, a R'hllor thing. Yes, but the, the, the fires themselves will be on top of the wall to to sort of like act as a deterrent to the others to come to the wall, right? I, That's the uh, idea. That could be, sure. I'm not really sure. I feel like you know the answer and you're, you're, you're merely mouthing this now. I mean, I don't. I'm trying to remember in the chapter if they he gave any more specific instructions beside and get night fires going. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I found it strange that the candidates didn't ask more questions at that point because... They asked yeah. a little bit, but it's like, what What actually are you going to do with the gift? Because we know what he's going to do with the gift, right? He's going to occupy it with the wildlings. That's the right. idea. He told John that, so we heard so, it firsthand. Right. But none of the future Lord Commanders had any interest in this. Okay. You want the gift? Yeah. Well. Right. His simple answer was, I'm going to do more with it than what you did. And they were like, right. okay. Yeah, well, we've done nothing <laughs> with it. So I guess that makes sense. Well, first of all, I'll say I appreciate that Sir Dennis Malister was willing and capable of speaking up and making sure that Stannis knows the Night's Watch stance and set clear boundaries regarding we don't get involved in anything going on south of the wall. Any battles, any any uh, disagreements, whatever, we don't get involved in that kind of thing. That took, you know, that, that took Lord Commander-like... Uh, tact right there well to a set i you're being a little sarcastic i can tell no but, i'm serious it did oh, okay it, he 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 showed his medal he can stand up to the king and say you could say all oh, you you know you can ask us for things but you can't ask us to do this because it goes yeah. against our rules but yes in that case i agree yes well you know we've only met sir dennis and cotter pike in this chapter, really, we've heard their names, but this is the first time we've really yeah. been introduced to them. Between the two, I think it's clear that Dennis Malister is the, the best choice for Lord Commander. And this is just one example that proves that he's... Yeah, they, they both make a good point, though, that that he, Dennis Malister's point is, I'm used to dealing with higher-ups, you know? I mean, right. I'm, I'm, I'm executive level. You need yes. someone in the executive level. Whereas Connor Pikes is... He's an old man. You need someone who can fight, and I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, at that, depending on the definition of what you mean by fight at that point, you know, like to have a fire in his belly to fight back, 
against policy and the king trying to Maybe. push you around, yeah. you know. But anyway, about the use of the gift, uh, yes, he is. In t- I feel like he's intentionally very vague about what he plans on doing with the gift and about rebuilding the castles because uh, Arthur Yarwick says, you don't have the men to rebuild the castles. And Stannis says, that's for me to figure out. Don't worry about it. So clearly he's intentionally holding back the wildling plan, which John knows, but apparently only John knows. So. But you know what? <laughs> if you've got a situation where you've got a guy who's in charge and he wants to build or rebuild 15 castles and occupy a tract of like 10,000 square miles and he happens to have an army of 100,000 people 10 feet away, I think you could put two and two together if you were really smart. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Well, he doesn't have that big of an army. He's only got a few thousand here, I think. No, but, but the uh, wildlings. I mean, the wildlings oh, yes. are well, a that... hundred thousand strong force. <laughs> yes. What else could he need all of that land and these castles for but that I see. group of people? Yes. I see what you're saying. You mean, you're you meaning they should be able to possibly put this together here. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Hey, it would be quite funny, actually, if Ed was the one who kept on understanding things, you know, sort of like <laughs> the one who really doesn't want it is like, oh, for the wildlings. Yeah. For the wildlings. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. If they these guys freaked out over simply wanting to rebuild the castles and use the gift, the wildling plan might just make their heads explode at this point yeah true enough true enough the the one thing is the one thing that would reassure them a little bit if it is the wildlings is the sense of temporariness because the wildlings you always feel like the wildlings will always choose to go back north of the wall if and when the others are defeated you would think the ones who aren't willing to at some point succumb to the rule south of the wall when the others are defeated will go back north where right. they can be free. They yes. are the free folk. Okay, exactly. Yeah. Yes. But, but by the way, I, I noticed that Davos doesn't appear in this chapter. He's 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 around, right? He hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, last we saw him, he was reading the letter uh, about the need from the Night's Watch and Stannis was standing over him with Lightbringer. But he's here. St- Stannis is here. So it doesn't seem like he would have killed him and then be like, you know what? Davis had a, actually had a really good point. I <laughs> yeah. wish I hadn't done that now. <laughs> Wait, so, so so we haven't seen Davos at the wall yet. He, not he's at not all. necessarily here. Not we haven't seen one hair on his chinny chin chin. Oh, that's interesting. I, I'm influenced by the TV show because at the TV show he was very much there. And so so oh. my question actually, the question I was going to pose is is moot because we don't know he's here. I was going to say that if Stannis wants to get this Lord Commander vote arranged. Even if he doesn't particularly want to put his fingers on the scales, but he just wants it over, instead of having Sam pluck up the courage to do this little plan himself, I would have Davos doing it because Davos could talk to these people and influence the vote, maybe in the same way that Sam's doing for all yeah, we care. Of course, work. except of course, Stannis doesn't want John to be Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, right? Yes, that is true. That about the last, I think, of all the. Options. All, all, all of the Night's Watch brothers available, that would be Stannis' last choice. Even Jaina Slint would rank ahead of John in that. <laughs> Although he says he wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, Stannis is pretty sharp about things. He he notices he knows who Aemon Maester Aemon is. Yeah, yeah. Uh not everybody knows that. I mean Tyrion and John came to the wall not knowing who he was. It's not right. like Everyone says, "Come to the wall and meet meet a meet a real life Targaryen." Yeah, well, well, like I mentioned, they are family, and and any hopes for a nice family reunion moment really never transpired here. He is, uh, I believe, it's great great uncle to Stannis. Wow. Yeah. So may, there might be three greats. It's two or three greats of an uncle that he is to Stannis. So but but even, I mean, the thing is, he seems like he's fallen out of people's memory. So even though he's related, it is interesting that Stannis knew. Yeah. I wish Stan, uh, Stannis had been a little more, used a little more deference. He, This man struggled with some of the similar 
things that Stannis is dealing with right now. Both of them had the the concept of being king thrust upon them. And, you know, Aemon was strong enough to push it away and turn it down. And Stannis says he doesn't want to be king, but he feels obligated to be king. So, you know, they, they had some similar pressures and expectations. And he is family. And he is so old. Like, there should be some deference just from his age alone. <laughs> It feels like he dismisses him. He's a little bit dismissive of him. I wish it wasn't quite so much that way. Yeah, you know, I, I think that George Martin treads a fine line with Stannis because because Stannis is good and noble in many ways. And he has, but he has aspects of him that are very dark. You know, yeah, basically yeah, yeah. his relationship with Melisandre and what she has him do makes him a much darker character. And just occasionally, I think Martin wants Stannis to not be pure and good and noble, just to remind you of the fact that he, he isn't those things because he's got this sort of darkness surrounding him. Yes, yes. He is such a deep, complex character. One of the most deep and complex characters yeah. that we have in this story. Yeah. But So one thing that happens is Melisandre talks about the battle for the dawn and and she says if we lose this battle the world dies and all the men kind of glance at each other confused and a little bit like what is she going on about here it's uh you know uh, can i interject that yes okay. yes anyone who ranged north of the wall should be yes what she says because there were holy terrors north of the wall. And so there is a battle coming with those guys. Those who've been safely at the wall not doing anything might well raise an eyebrow and go, oh, grumpkins and snarks. Right. Yes. And with this group present here, it only Ed and Sam would know firsthand about the others and the white attack at the Fist of the First Men and then the, the forced march the fleeing from the fist to Craster's because none of the other men present were involved in the ranging. So, you yes. know, Three Finger Hob was not there. Uh, Cotter Pike wasn't there. Uh, Dennis Malister wasn't there. Jaina Slint certainly wasn't there. And neither was Bowen Marsh. So they've not, uh, none of them have seen it firsthand just how real it was. Yeah. So that's a good point. That's a good point that, that actually the three main candidates for Lord Commander, none of them really understand the, the real threat here. All of right. them would be obsessed by wildlings. Right. The only one actually who might have some sense of it. Well, I mean, they could all have some sense of it, but Janice Lint has traveled in the presence of Alyssa Thorne for quite a while. And Alyssa Thorne is aware. He had that unaware. hand. Right. He had the hand. Exactly. Yes. yes. In fact... Those three, none of them have e were even in Castle Black. Jaina Slint, Cotter Pike, Sir Dennis Malister were not in Castle Black when the two whites attacked in the castle. Yeah, so, you know, they really might think that she's just doing some kind of, like, overly dramatic speech about the importance of this war. Right, and also, if Stannis wants the wildlings to man the wall and the gift then those are three poor choices for Lord Commander for him. Yes, yes, because they really might not understand why he feels the need to do this. Right. Dolorous Ed, on the other hand, is probably of the opinion, who cares about the wildlings? You should <laughs> see what's over there. Right. And Jon Snow, who uh, it's never specifically said in this chapter, but it's pretty heavily implied <laughs> that that's who <laughs> Sam has in mind. <laughs> Father there are a hand lot of, of the criteria king. that lead to nobody else. You know? <laughs> right. Father hand of the king, brother a king, that alone should pretty much <laughs> narrow you in. Yeah, I think so. Um, so. So the mining on Dragonglass, while they can, makes good sense. Uh, good knowledge from Sam that it only works on the others, not on the whites. Melisandre grasps the importance of that straight away. The whites are just animated corpses. You can just kill them, however. But the white walkers, the others, are different uh, dragon gas, dragon glass is fire made solid. It makes sense that it would defeat creatures of the dark. My question about all of that is, why do they think they're going to lose Dragonstone? 
I mean, well, I can get that they've abandoned it to a certain extent, but who's after it? Well, so uh, in the Jamie chapter that I, I can't remember which Jamie chapter might have been the one when he first arrived back to King's Landing. Uh, Tywin mentions that Varys sent fishermen into the bay at Dragonstone and saw that there was only a token force. So the Targaryens are aware of the vacant port there. And you know, that at that moment, Tywin was afraid that Stannis had sailed for Dorne and was going to uh, make an alliance with the, the Dornish. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, it would make sense for them to, to take that island just to give Stannis one less place to be, you know, one less place, yeah. one less safe harbor, I guess. And he also mentions that his Castellan Roland is harvesting the uh, dragon glass on Dragonstone, and I did a background in the last Davis chapter. Uh, he was he's the uh, bastard of oh, Night Song. Yes. He helped Edric Storm escape, and uh, yeah, I did a background. He was the last surviving member of House Karen, although technically he is a Storm, not a Karen. You may recall this from a while ago. Anyway, he's now been named Castellan of Dragonstone, which also indicates that hopefully Davis was also forgiven. If if one of his co-conspirators is now Castellan, that he didn't kill Davis and then decide to pardon the rest. Mm -hmm. So Eamon insists on seeing, air quotes, Lightbringer. And what he learns from this is Lightbringer isn't hot. It may glow like it's uh, that it may glow like it's hot. It may right. appear fiery, but it is in fact cool. What does he? What does he learn from that? Does this make him more skeptical that Stannis is Azora High? I mean, maybe it does. Maybe maybe Azora High really carried a fiery sword. But since he's a character of legend, it's possible that his sword was just red and cold right. to the touch. <laughs> for all we know. Yeah, I guess at some level it does seem odd that a sword of fire would produce no heat. I mean, even uh, Thoris of Mir's swords were actually on fire. Is but, Thoris of know. Mir a sword of fire? Maybe. Um, but, you know, Sam thinks, so we get, you know, we get Sam's thoughts. He tells us through his thought that Stannis seems super uncomfortable when Melisandre brings up him being a Zora High. And we still have to my knowledge, no mention of how Stannis came about owning Lightbringer. The last we saw, his fiery sword sword required oven mitts and fell apart as he held it. Now suddenly he's got Lightbringer. So... Uh, I I will say that therefore he has upgraded his sword because now he doesn't need those. He's he's perfected (laughs) whatever he's carrying in his scabbard. Yeah, that's right. It still but looks even... <laughs> good, but it does no longer burn. No longer re- it requires an oven mitt. So I guess uh, Eamon may be wondering whether the Lightbringer is actually Lightbringer, and if so, could that be why Stannis is so uncomfortable at this mention? Because maybe he's not Azora High. You yeah, know? maybe Eamon so... knew Azora High. <laughs> <laughs> So Sam is certainly braver than he used to be. We remember he couldn't look Mormont in the eye. He has, of course, survived a lot, uh, more than most of his brothers. I like the sentence you put here, more than most of his brothers. Is Has he survived more than most of his brothers, or has he survived unlike most of his brothers? <laughs> well, that's another way to phrase it, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if you think about all he's gone through, the fight at the Fist, then the march to Craster's, where he killed another and became Sam the Slayer. Then the mutiny at Craster's. Then they had to flee because the others were on the way to Craster's. And then, remember, he and Gilly and the baby were attacked by whites in that village. And and then he had to survive riding on the back of an elk with a guy with really cold hands. So <laughs> he's been through a lot. He definitely should have some confidence at this point. That's true. I mean... Everything's relative. And once you've done those things, talking to a couple of your superiors about their futures may not be as scary as it once would have been. Yes. And Sam has that thought toward the end of the chapter when he's thinking, oh, no, what have I done? And then he thinks, why why am I scared of Sir Dennis Malister and Cotter Pike when I saw Crow eating Small Paul's face? 
Right. <laughs> you know, so yeah, when you put it in perspective, it's like, eh, I've faced worse. Pike claims that Sir Dennis is too old to be Lord Commander. What, what, is he? Is does he have a point, McKelly? Well, we don't know exactly. He, we get some information here. He was Lord Commander of the Shadow Tower for thirty-three years. Okay, he, and he won a tourney at twenty-two, presumably before joining the Night's Watch. I don't think that's something they do very often <laughs> in the Night's Watch. Is attend tourneys, so. Even if he I mean, won. it might be a good marketing tool. You know, if they go off and win <laughs> tourneys all the time, some of the young bucks would be like, i got to get me some of that. Yes, that's right. And, you know, as you said that, I'm just remem- reminded that uh, when when Benjen, uh, remember the, the, well, everyone knows, the tourney at Harrenhal, the famous tourney at the Harrenhal. The famous tourney at Harrenhal, yes. Yes, that Rhaegar uh, won. There was a, a Night's Watch brother that spoke there that really affected Benjen. And, and, you know, there's a lot of thought that that's what caused uh-huh. Benjen, Benjen to join the Night's Watch. Well, if that guy's out attending tourneys and stuff, why not Sir Dennis Malister? Maybe it was Sir Dennis Malister that was, right. <laughs> was the brother. Anyway, we've gotten off task. Um, so even if he won that tourney at age 22 and then immediately felt compelled to go join the Night's Watch with his purse of riches and then pulled a Jaina slint and became commander of the shadow tower within like weeks of of showing up he that he'd be at least 55 years old uh, assuming he didn't follow that path he's likely in his 60s at least so you know in this day and age of westeros it's pike, that's pretty yeah yeah man. and pike says he's been he won the tournament 50 years ago so that would put him at 72 Pike probably is exaggerating for effect, but uh, he's. He, it looks like he's in his late sixties, realistically. Right. Yes, and we don't get any indication of Pike's age to compare the two men. Honestly, at all, so with what's coming, it really doesn't matter how old they are. They're they're as old as they're going to be, <laughs> <laughs> unless they get a whole bunch of that dragon glass from Dragon exactly. Storm from from uh, Dragonstone up to uh, Eastwatch real quick here. You know, Pike almost makes a case against himself when he is arguing to Sam about why he should be Lord Commander and not Sir Dennis. He he acknowledges that that Malister is good at brooding over maps, but he's no fighter. But, you know, in the current environment in which they find themselves, a tactical, thoughtful leader is more important than fighting prowess. From the leader's perspective, you need a lot of good fighters. But when you're talking about your Lord Commander, he doesn't need to be the best swordsman of the group. Yeah. He needs to be the best tactician, the best leader in the group. I would imagine Pike was practicing his stump speech on uh, Sam, and he probably thought to himself, I'm not going to say that in front of everybody. (laughs) Yes. Although Malister kind of echoed Pike's thoughts when he said, the Lord Commander is a Lord first. He must be able to treat with right. Lords and Kings. So, uh, and Pike mentions that it's not acquiescing to Stannis's wishes for the gift and the castles is not a terrible idea, but it you know it could be a slippery slope here. Yeah, and you need someone strong enough to tell a king when enough is enough, which first of all is another mark against Slint because. He's not standing up to any king, that's for sure. Well, but he might stand up to Stannis because Stannis has just, you know, (laughs) said blatantly, I don't like you to everybody, so. Right. (laughs) Yeah, so Dennis is much more courteous and kind and patient with Sam than Pike was. Uh, And because both Pike and Malister think that Sam's words are coming from Maester Aemon, uh, it's kind of like you have some sympathy for Malister here because he thinks he's hearing this, you know, he's hearing Eamon's views. But then when Sam lies about it coming from Stannis, you know, or at least that Stannis is planning to make Pike the thing, then maybe that makes him feel a bit better. That it's like, well, that's Stannis's opinion, you know, why should I care? Yeah. So, yeah, look, you know, just like you said, Sam kind of, he tells each man that that uh, Stannis is going to promote the other guy. And from Pike's perspective, I could see genuine concern because Malister 
feels like the logical successor. He's been a commander longer. He's well-respected. He's educated. He's a calmer head. He's better at treating uh, with other leaders, just all the things we've talked about. But from Malister's perspective, I would feel like it would be a true head-scratcher and rather hurtful that he'd be like, Cotter Pike? Why but, would he elevate Cotter but Pike? The the case you just made for Malister is the reason. Because Malister could stand up to... Uh, because oh. Cal- because he's able to treat as an equal with some with a royalty, he would right. be able to do what's best for the Night's Watch. Whereas Pike would be browbeaten by being low class and base born. Okay. And so Stannis might want that because he figures he could control him. Yes, sure, I could see that. I was the only rationale I could come up with is that maybe Stannis and. Cotter bonded while at Eastwatch or traveling from yeah, Eastwatch to Castle that's Black. True. And he that's true. learned something um, about him that he liked. I will say, so, I mean, obviously, you, you, you we, we kind of bounced around it, but it was definitely John that Sam is promoting. And to the credit of both men, both Pike and Malister, they, they were genuine in that, I don't want this. I just don't want it to be that other guy. They both are like, well, you know what? They... He, it could be John. That could work, you know? Yes. Yeah, I think Sam does a great job of playing to the un, his understanding of each man. Yeah. With Malister, he plays up John's blood. He's from a great family, father, hand of the king. His brother was a king. He's maester educated, castle trained, respect of the other men like Jorah Mormont and, Gior Mormont and uh, Donald Noy and Corn Halfhand. And with Pike, he... he conveniently left all that stuff out and said he's a great fighter but unfortunately he's bastard born which plays right into cotter pike also being bastard born Mm -hmm. so yeah i think he did a really good job of but um, but the one thing is sam's plan would have fallen if either man was being dishonest about his own personal ambitions if one of these men was personally ambitious then yes no matter what you say about john he's still gonna be like well i mean yeah sure john would be good but i'll be better you know Right. Yes. Yeah, but like you said, both men claimed that they don't want the role. Pike says he's too far from the ocean, and Malister doesn't say why he doesn't necessarily aspire to this office. But he's old. He stepped aside probably. before, so yeah, twice. When he thought there was a better choice. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he's happy to live out his days as commander of the Shadow Tower. At this Maybe point. he thinks he's too old. <laughs> <laughs> he's like. <laughs> Pike's got a point. I really am too old. Right, exactly, yeah. And now, a short interlude while we discuss spoilers for our upper-level sustainers. Join, and you get to hear what we're about to say. Learn with me. (laughs) All right, do you have some background for us? I do. So, uh, Stannis tells Sam that Sam's father, Randall Tarly, is an able soldier who defeated Robert at Ashford, despite Mace Tyrell taking credit for the victory. So Stannis is referring to a battle early in Robert's Rebellion. Robert left Storm's End under Stannis' command and marched west with his army. It's it's kind of unclear why he was in Ashford, which is a town in the Reach and therefore loyal to the Tyrells, possibly to secure the Stormlands' western edge, or he simply just got caught there by Lord Randall. Either way, the Tyrell van, led by Lord Randall, ran into Robert and his force there at Ashford. Uh, The Tyrell force overran Roberts, causing the Baratheon force to flee from the battle before the main part of the Tyrell army arrived. During the battle, Lord Randall killed Lord Caffernan in single combat. Robert fled north to join his allies, Ned and Hoster Tully, and that is how he ended up in Stony Sept, which we heard about in Aria 5. That's where he hid out while he was injured. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Robert abandoning the Stormlands allowed the Tyrell force easy access to Storm's End and lay siege to the castle. A siege we're all familiar with, as Stannis, Renly, and company nearly starved to death, if not for Davis and his onions. Yes, absolutely. It all comes together now. Indeed. So comparison with the television show, pretty much none of this happens. Sam okay. does want uh, John to be Lord Commander, but his efforts are munged into a single scene later on. Um, uh, Pedantry, uh, I don't have anything, did you? No. All right, they're getting better. 
Your yes. Mind, editors are getting better. Uh, our uh, pen trick corner has been uh, is starting to get cobwebs and such. <laughs> <laughs> We're rarely in it anymore. <laughs> All right, news and notes. We really didn't have much uh, news and notes this week. Um, we are going to have our first sustainer video chat of the year very soon. We're thinking mm-hmm. it should be somewhere around January 23rd, which is a, a Tuesday. So, uh, you know, if you are a sustainer, get ready for that. If you're not a sustainer and you want to be involved, now will be a great time to join. Awesome. And we got a review from Emma Otter at Apple Podcasts. Best podcast. This is my favorite podcast of all time. The guys are so funny, but also do a great job of taking us through the A Song of Ice and Fire series. My favorite part is the background info. Highly recommend this podcast to anyone. Well, thank you, Emma Otter. We appreciate that. Yes, thank you very much. Great review. All right, let's conclude. So uh, Stannis is here, ready to fight the others. Uh, It's good news for the realm and potentially for the Night's Watch, if the Night's Watch can change their focus from keeping wildlings out to fighting the Battle of the Dawn. The true reason why they are guarding the wall in the first place. Quite. Yeah. Yes. It's, he's definitely intentionally not telling them about, about the wildling occupation plan. Uh, I don't know what happens. Well, I do know what happens, but we don't know <laughs> at this moment. We don't know what happens when he divulges this information. Uh, the Night's Watch is heavily outnumbered so mutiny doesn't seem very yeah. productive yeah um his status as as a high still seems a bit sketchy and he himself seems a bit embarrassed about it does it yes. matter or is right. it just, just yeah. that he's here willing to fight the act the, the the most important foe we all face exactly i mean whether or not he's Zora high he showed up that should count for something you know yeah like yeah, yeah. if he even if he's just old Stannis Baratheon, and that sword really isn't a yeah. Lightbringer, he's here. So you know, first time he hits someone with it, the red paint chips off. <laughs> yeah, well, when he goes to fight the others with it, are they just gonna laugh at his glowing sword? Yes. Yeah. Or, or, or worse, as soon as he pulls it out, they're like, "Where's your oven mitt? That's not real." <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh. I sure hope Roland Storm can harvest enough dragon glass and get it to the wall as quickly as possible. Yes, it's sort of strange that the caches in the north were so few and far between. But I guess yeah. it's kind of useless, really, isn't it? Other than this, so... Right. It's too brittle to actually use as a weapon, so... Yeah. Yeah. So Sam definitely seems to have found a solution to the impasse. John is broadly acceptable, is relatively well liked, apart from everybody who hates his guts, of course. Um, <laughs> Except for them, <laughs> <laughs> which seems to be about every three per- people that yeah, he meets. Exactly. One out of every three. <laughs> he, he's loved and hated in equal measure. He is. Uh, he is just a teenager and does have a bit of a dubious reputation still, of course, because he has, you know, killed Corrin Halfhand. Yes, and, and slept with rode the with the wildlings and right. slept with a wildling. Yeah, so those who believe that story, you know, that's that could be a problem. Yeah. So can it happen? Will it happen? Would John do a good job? I mean, it seems conceivable. Uh, He's so young. He's so yeah. young. If he were five years older, I would have a lot more confidence. But he's like 16. You know, that's... I know he's... By Stark standards, he's been a man grown for about 12 years, but still, he's Join just the a wall boy. awfully late. <laughs> yes. But, and also, lest we forget, John is contemplating a career change, you know, courtesy of Stannis, relieving him right. of his vows and making him uh, Lord of Winterfell. Uh, so this outcome, if it were to come to pass, could very much thwart Stannis's plans, and that might not go well either. Yes, that could be he a big He said problem. he wanted to treat with a single Lord Commander, but <laughs> he'd be annoyed if it's the guy he had another plan for. Yes, in a big plan. Very important plan. Yeah. And of course, that also colours... John would want this, I think, as a member of the Night's Watch, but I don't... I, I do think John is interested in saying yes to Stannis' offer. I'm not sure right. he'd say yes, but I think he's definitely considering it. So, yeah. I mean, what happens if he decides he's going to take him up on the offer and then gets named Lord Commander? Now it's... You know, it's like back to the drawing board. <laughs> yeah. But where do we go next, McKelly? Well, we're going nowhere. We're going absolutely nowhere. We're staying because right here Because next up is Jon Snow? 
John is up next, and just All like these we questions discussed, will be answered. Yes, he's wrestling with his desire versus his duty. What what mm. will win out? And you know, Stannis said he wants a decision today. Well, unfortunately, he's going to have to wait till next week because. Uh... Ah, <laughs> well, there's four ways that you could help us. You could leave us a five star rating and a positive review, like Emma Otter did. You could buy merchandise at ghosts of Harrenhal.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghosts Harrenhal. Become a sustainer at one of the higher tiers and you can come to our next sustainer call. Or you can just donate to our cause directly through our website, ghosts of and if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, you can reach us on our social medias. You can follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.